I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by David Gladstone, a writer, photographer, philosopher, and world traveler. David's a longtime friend of Jack Sarfati, part of Jacques Vallée's Invisible College, and he's met some of the most remarkable minds in modern history and been part of some of the most remarkable events of the 20th century. He joins us today to share thoughts, stories, and insights on some of the most interesting stories of our time. So, David, welcome. Today, we are talking about your new book, The Great Race, Physics, Paranormal, Time Travel, UFOs. This is a book about yourself, Jack Sarfati, the San Francisco intellectual culture, and exploring the unknown, right? Yes. Thank, uh, thanks, Tim. Um, it is. Uh, it's a it's been a big project actually today is the nine month anniversary since I left San Francisco today, nine months ago. And I've been working on the book until just now. And I'm actually preparing for a second edition. So one of the things that I like about this book is your approach. It reminds me of what they call gonzo journalism, similar to Hunter S. Thompson. You're immersed in the story that you're telling. You're sharing what you know from your own perspective, and you're not trying to paint a full picture from this omniscient view, I guess. So was that an intentional choice as a writer? Yes, it was an intentional choice. I was trained as a journalist at American University. I attended the Watergate trials. Um, I got to meet many fine journalists in Washington. I met many politicians. I met Hunter Thompson in San Francisco when he fell into my booth at Tosca Cafe. <laughs> Trump, he actually fell in and there he was. And I didn't hadn't actually read his book you know, fear and loathing until after that happened. But uh, I, I was a photographer there and a photographer in Washington, D.C. as well. And uh, those were two great experiences, actually. And uh, so I decided to do it just from that. Uh, my recollections of my closest friend and my own experience, so I couldn't use an omniscient view. Yeah. Well, it, and this is actually this is the reason I wanted to interview you, because you have you have been part of so many amazing events. Right. And, you know, so I, I, the book starts with current events. So let me get in there. In fact, tomorrow the world will be hearing from UFO whistleblowers testifying on the floor of Congress. That itself is I, I think it's it's groundbreaking historically. Um so the timing of the book and indeed this interview is really quite fortuitous. Uh, since this book is talking about current events, you even quote David Grush in it. Let me ask, what do you think will happen tomorrow when he speaks? To be honest, I don't expect much. I think I saw a headline yesterday that said the the government had refused to give some important information to the members of Congress. Mm -hmm. Now, I, uh, I interned in Congress for a year, and I got to see Congress people and senators close up. I remember Biden as well. And I, to be honest, I was never very impressed by their intelligence or their understanding of current events, except in terms of their own very small focused self-interest. So um, I really don't expect much tomorrow. I, I can't say I was thrilled with what I have read from him. It is important in a way, but I just, he doesn't have firsthand information. You know, everything he has is secondhand. So what can I expect? I'm prepared to be surprised. I could put it that way, but uh, do I expect anything? No, I think the government has clamped a uh, veil of silence over it. 
and they haven't changed their stripes. So I don't expect, I don't expect much except a lot of people will be disappointed. Well, I, that's, I think that's a very valid perspective. Um, so a, a good portion of the book involves Dr. Jack Sarfati, along with his theories about time travel and UFOs and your relationship with him. And I think that that's incredibly important. You have known him for decades. You've studied his work. Can you tell me about the relationship? Can you tell me about, you know, just, <laughs> I mean, you know, being a close friend there, because I know that that comes into play so much in this book. Well, I think all of us who know Jack would be stunned at his maturity, his quiet ability to listen, and his soft-spoken manner. <laughs> I'm actually kidding. Um, I think this is a question about Jack that I think will get the same reaction from all of us who know him. It's always, it's like a ride in an amusement park. You never know what's going to happen with Jack. Um, he's, he's a character. Uh, you know, he, he's, in a way he's like, uh, he's a bit like a 13 year old in an 83 year old body. He's, he's, he, and he looks fantastic. I watched him on your show and your podcast the other day. And I was, I was stunned how great he looked and how quick he is. Yeah. The, the facility of his memory. And somebody asked me about him. And I just said, Jack works in a very complex and difficult field. And what he has to remember is it's, it's unbelievable. And he does. And uh, his, his facility, his ability is, uh, you know, he's like a violin player who knows, you know, he's he, he doesn't forget anything. He's always had an, an incredible memory. I mean, he remembers things about, I have trouble remembering yesterday, but Jack is, you know, um, he's, he's certainly a little devil in a way. He's always had that... Um, uh, you know, he's he can be impulsive, and uh, you know he he's funny, and you know he's. But what he really is is a physicist, and I would say that of everything that Jack is, what he has given to being a physicist is 110% of everything. So everything else that we all are in life, oh, um, maybe a little bit less, but he's a physicist. First, yeah. last, and always, I would say. Well, he is a character. And and I think that that's important to point out. And you were a character as well. And I, I don't mean that in a negative way. Yeah. I, I think, you know... You've referenced how the hippie saved physics by David Kaiser in the past, and that is worth an interview in itself. But I, I want to explore a little bit where that comes from, because yourself and Jack are both part of this San Francisco intellectual culture. And I think it is incredibly important uh, that that people understand how that came about. This was a melting pot of scientists, engineers, artists, and writers who basically came together in the 60s and stayed together, right? And it's it's not that everyone knew each other, you know, I, I'm not that naive, but it's, you know, it's they ran in similar circles and you had all these interactions and you had this cross-pollination of ideas that happened. Uh, was, what was it like being a part of that? Well, it was uh, it was like being in an aquarium in a big tank. And um, the fact is, you did meet many people. I mean, 
Francis Coppola used to come. I lived a butcher, above a butcher shop and Francis would come there and buy, uh, it's called Cap Capretto. Uh, I think that's what it's called. It's a spring, spring lamb or spring goat. And he would come and buy that. And, you know, um, the cafe was a, was a gathering spot for people, you know, district attorneys and actresses and intellectuals would come there. Susan Sontag, um, Philip Dick came there, Norman Minnie, uh, a, a guy who was a um, fictional character, a real person who was a fictional character in the Philip Dick book, the Vallis trilogy. Uh, let's see, um, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, uh, Allen Ginsberg, Jack uh, Hirschman, and many people, uh, Paul Kantner, from the Jefferson Airplane, Jack Cassidy, you know, many of the rock and roll people would, from the 60s would come to the Cafe Trieste. It was, uh, I remember meeting France Nguyen from South Pacific. She was the beautiful island girl swimming naked in that, uh, you know, and, and I met her and I said, you know, I had such a crush on you when I was six years old and she looked at me and she said, what about now? <laughs> I was, you know, yeah. it was great. That happened a lot. Well, and it, I, you know, I, I again, I, I want to point out how influential this San Francisco intellectual culture was and still is. And, and again, for me, th this is one of those things where you see echoes of this right you see influences of this throughout our society and i think a lot of people don't realize it most people don't think about it you know probably nor nor should they on a daily basis but um but it's one of those things that's important for people to recognize so some of the the people that came to my mind were like steve jobs richard Feynman, timothy leary bruce sterling andy warhol these were all people who were in that community, as well as, I mean, you just gave me a list of maybe 15 or 20 very important thinkers, right? So this this is the area where SRI did their psychic studies. It's the birthplace of cyberpunk. It's the home of psychedelic culture, uh, the second home for many of the biggest bands of the 60s. You know, it's also the birthplace of really the modern computing culture, you know, so there is so much that happened there. And the thing that I tend to believe is a lot of this wouldn't have happened without that vibrant culture, right? You had these people with different specializations and different walks of life, but they were coming together and cross pollinating ideas you know, and so folks like Andy Warhol were able to influence folks like, I just say Steve Jobs, potentially, you know, even if they didn't know each other directly, those influences were there. And I think that it contributed to something that's richer and larger and more dynamic than itself. And I think in turn, over time, it's helped to make just our culture in general, richer and more vibrant and more dynamic. Yes, um, I met some of those people actually not in San Francisco, but I met them in other places. I met Allen Ginsberg when I was 19 at Rochdale in Toronto, Canada. Uh, I used to spend a lot of time at the Gotham Book Mart in New York City. My brother worked there and I met many, many, many writers there and actually, you know, and read about them there and I found that an amazing uh, experience. And Andy Warhol did a movie with Jack's girlfriend, Suki's sister. Her name was Edie. She was the original It Girl in 1965, hanging around with Bob Dylan. And a lot of that happened then. Uh, I worked in New York selling wine and I met a lot of people, including John Warner's father, yeah. who had married Elizabeth Taylor. 
it, it's just amazing what happened. So it was a, it was a little bit of an international scene. But when I came to San Francisco, many of them came to San Francisco and walked into the cafe, and I met them there, and um, I did a lot of reading and a lot of researching. Um, I was a reader and academic, really, and finished my degree in San Francisco um, at State. And, uh, you know, so I was a literary person with a strong interest in science from the beginning. And I did study some astronomy. But with Jack Sarfati, what I got was a many year, uh, say a little bit of a, a seminar, a long seminar in sciences. And, and it wasn't always a smooth experience because Jack doesn't suffer fools gladly. And it's like you get hit by his wiffle ball bat constantly. You know what, <laughs> if you, if you make a mistake, I mean, and it's like that today, you know, you, you can, you can cross a red line of his very easily. And you, you don't know where it is, but he keeps you sharp. And uh, it was there that I realized that uh, this invisible college uh, sprung up around Jack. And it's something that I write about in the book. I write about the first invisible college that came up in the early 17th century because it actually spurred a lot of development and a lot of scientific development that was important. And now we have a new a new uh, renaissance of that and what Jacques Vallée discussed and some other people talked about in the 60s and 70s has borne some very important fruit and David Kaiser you know gave gave some foreshadowing of that because a lot of it happened after his book ended a lot of it bore fruit that maybe he didn't see exactly then in 2012 but by 2023 what what jack is doing is beyond anything he ever did before and now he was a character back in the 70s and the 60s but what he's doing now is far more serious really and 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 i think he's motivated by the i think he has a very clear idea of time and he knows the clock is ticking and he's working constantly on it. And I, I am impressed by that because he gives himself totally to that. And he's made his life as much as he can to be, allow him to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'd say that's his, you know, he knows what he wants to do and what he wants, what he wants to, to give and I'm sure he wants to be the hero of his own legend. I have no doubt of that. But, uh, you know, it's not just out of ego. He wants to fulfill his destiny matrix, what he would call. So I think that's, uh, and you want to measure up to what uh, life has handed you. I, I can't blame him. I think that's one of my, uh, it's something that we all have to deal with. Well, Invisible College is the perfect term. And that was a, the title of a book by Jacques Vallée. And yes. it's also been a, a, a more general term, right, for um, basically groups of scientists and intellectuals in general who come together, meet, and discuss ideas. Now, a lot of that is happening online now, but a yes. lot of that happened, most of that happened in person. Right. And and again, it, it wasn't from as I understand things, it wasn't that everyone knew everyone, but you had different circles and different specializations and they crossed paths quite often and they were able to communicate different things. And so if Andy Warhol and Jack Serfati end up talking, they're going to be speaking different languages, but they're also going to be able to share ideas that make the worlds of both so much richer. So the, the invisible college though, is, is really focused more on the specializations, right? You're talking about the physics. And so in Jack's case, that's basically um, 
the physics of you know warp drives, time travel, as well as a lot of the SRI material. Or I, I believe in the book you've described ER equals EPR. Yes. Um, one of the people that I talk to a lot is Russell Targ. And I just talked to him twice in the last few days. And I find talking to Russell has been very important because I've learned a lot from him. And we're on the same page like this. And it's wonderful to, to ha still have him here. Um, the Invisible College that uh, originally of Robert Boyle, as a young boy, he was taken to meet Galileo, you know, in Italy. And he spent time talking with the great man. And so I write about Galileo in the book as well, because there's similarity in the story of Galileo and Jack, you know, not that, you know, they're, they're, they're not the same, but they personality wise, they have, they have some uh, things in common and, and it's fascinating. And the people like John Milton and Newton and uh, um, the guy who 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 did all those buildings in London, his his name is slipping my mind, and and, and he built the big the big uh, church on Ludgate Hill, St Paul's Cathedral, mm -hmm. and you know after the fire of London and all these incredible scientists, uh, they were part of the original college, Invisible College, back in the sixteen hundreds. And then in the uh, late 1700s, early 1800s, you have uh, Michael Faraday and, uh, you know, others, you know, the, Kant, the philosophy of Kant and all these people and Goethe and um, William Herschel, um, Darwin's grandfather, Erasmus, and all these great people, and they actually did know each other. William Brake, they used to go on walks together. Sometimes, I, I used to read in this history called uh, The Birth of the Modern by um, Paul Johnson wrote The Birth of the Modern. It's a great book. And he writes about the, the connection of the poets, Byron and Shelley and Keats and, and how much Coleridge, how much connection they had with the development and invention of electricity, Volta, Ampere. I mean, they all did know each other and they hung out together. So there was a very personal connection. Now it's a connection online, but it's very important. And um, so people like Jose and David Chester and all these people that you now know as well from you know, this is all very important. And I'm I'm hoping for a little bit of a widening and blurring of the lines between the specializations so that people can talk and not only about formulae and things like that, but to talk about their ideas behind all that. Yeah. Well, it's it's a marketplace of ideas, right? And I, I think that's really important because uh, we tend to view science as kind of a linear progression, right? It's um, someone is, you know, they're doing experiment for experiment, they're learning bits and pieces, and they're putting those together in a straight line. But in reality, you know, without those interactions, without the sharing and collaboration, uh, it doesn't really go anywhere. They're unable to make those leaps that really take things where it needs to go. And, and that's part of what you're talking about. So I wanted to mention the Cafe Trieste. I wanted to get into that. You mentioned that earlier. This yes. was, I, I, the way to describe this, I, I'm in awe of that. That is on my bucket list of places. I'm going to take my camera down there and get some photos. Uh, this was what we would describe as like a cool little coffee shop. Every town has one where people like to think, write, and socialize. But in the case of Cafe Trieste, those people were some of the greatest writers of the beat era. So again, you'd mentioned like Lawrence Ferlinghetti, Alan Watts, Jack Kerouac, Allen Ginsberg, Richard Brodigan, Bob Kaufman, Gregory Corso, uh, let me see, Michael McClure, Kenneth Rexroth, Neely Tchaikovsky. That's, that's only a few. 
of the many people, including Philip yourself and, and others. Yeah, it, it was uh, it was amazing, uh, and we all met at the cafe, and you know we all stood in line for our coffees, and we all knew Yolanda, Yolanda, who was the lady. She was like my second mother. She we were all chi to her, you know, high chi, you know. Um, if she didn't like someone, she'd tell them in Italian, va via stronzo, you know, she was, uh, she was great. And uh, uh, I found uh, the cafe a, a great meeting place and it was kind of a melting pot because we were there, you know, we were there, we were, we were aficionados of the cafe and the Italian coffee, the espresso. And we would sit there and I would often sit with Paul Kantner inside or out and, or with Jack, you we used to sit around the ground table with Jack and Jack would be talking about faster than light schemes back in the early day. Now he's discovered he doesn't need that anymore. He's moved beyond the faster than light. And uh, so there's all kinds of things that developed over those years. And it, unfortunately, I, I think things have changed such. Everybody's looking at their phones now and there isn't as much socializing as there was back then before there were cell phones. And I remember those days with fondness because the cell phones have sort of monopolized our time and our consciousness a little bit too much. Well, um, yeah. And that's, that's important to point out that that's changing. That area is changing a lot. So San Francisco in general, it now has sky high housing prices and that that's from the tech industry. Right. So I, from what I understand, that's driven a lot of the intellectuals out. They've moved to different places where it's, it's less, well, I mean, less expensive, number one, but also um, it's it's less dominated by that culture, right? I mean, in your case, you moved to Europe, so. Yes. Um, I left nine months ago today and came to Norway. And now I live in a little place where Henrik Ibsen, Ibsen was born. Nobody's ever heard of this this little town, but uh, it's very congenial to me. And, but I can't say that I don't dream about San Francisco every night, I do. And I've been away for nine months and I, I can't help it. It's just, that's where my life, I spent 40 plus years there. And uh, I guess that will never change. I don't, I don't dream about being in Norway very often almost never i dream about being in san francisco and um uh you know it's but it's that it's it's all from what the legacy of that time which isn't there now and unfortunately what's happening in the united states and it, it's worried me a great deal and i i think i had to get away i came to to norway to, to get away from yeah to get away from there so I would get some distance and so I could write the book without worrying about the news every day and try to separate myself. Um, I thought a lot about James Joyce, who I used to study when I was in college, and Joyce went to Trieste. And uh, I, um, I came here to Norway and so I've been working on this book, but now I'm about finished and probably other things will happen, but uh, I really, I still think about San Francisco and I go back there in my dreams. I can't, can't help it. <laughs> well, David, on that note, let me thank you so much for your time today. It has been a privilege and an honor to be able to interview you about this. So again, the book is The Great Race, Physics, Paranormal, Time Travel, and UFOs. It's about yourself, Jack Sarfati, San Francisco, the intellectual culture, and exploring the unknown. Thank you, Tim. It's been a pleasure.